Discover Vermont and New Hampshire's roles in the Underground Railroad. We'll learn about courageous abolitionists who are part of the network of aiding fugitive enslaved people in the years prior to the Civil War. Our speaker, Michelle Arnosky Sherburn, is a Vermont historian and author and for 30 years focused on researching the Underground Railroad, New England history, and the Civil War. I told her I didn't think she could have lived long enough to have been doing it for 30 years. She barely looks that age now. She assures me she is a little older than that. She has books available for purchase, and as you've noted, there are some wonderful displays. So after the program, please feel free to peruse the displays. Her order of books didn't come in this week, so she does have some here, but if there aren't enough for everybody, she will take orders. And she also has bookmarks, enough for everybody, so that you can have that as a reference as well. Several years ago, Michelle worked with a teacher at Riverside Middle School with his classes studying our local history. She has also done programs for the Hillsborough, New Hampshire community and therefore had already prepared information local to our area. She's been able to custom fit this program to present the history of local people, locations, and events. She lives in Newberry, Vermont, which is a bit of a drive from here. She and her husband recently purchased a 150-year-old weekly newspaper called The Journal Opinion. Its publishing day is Tuesday, and because of that, she was able to present today. And we're so glad that you all were able to make it. So, here we are. Please welcome Michelle Arnosky Sherburn. Thank you, Dave. I'm not a techie. It was Amy, right? Amy helped set up uh, because I'm not a tech, tech, techno savvy person. Welcome, welcome to uh, uh, history in Vermont, one that has not always been um, that well known. And I'm really grateful to be here. I'm very glad that. Um, I was able to uh, come down, and thank you so much for changing your day for me. I'm really grateful. Our press day is Tuesday, and there's no wiggle room, and you don't want me talking after deadline, because it's just like, blah. <laughs> um, so uh, the introduction was very nice, and thank you for pronouncing both my names correctly. Um, and just to kind of give you a, a, a quick glance of like who I am. Um, so uh, I've been interested in history since high school. Uh, started out researching ancient Egypt. I just got back from Hartford. They had Beyond King Tut, the immersive experience. <gasps> wow, that was awesome. Uh, so I've been interested in history no matter what it is. Um, and I started working at a, uh, we, a weekly newspaper right after high school. No college, just went right into work and um, started learning uh, the industry and have been working in a newspaper for about 40 years. So um, it's, it's been an interesting journey, uh, but I've, I've done the gamut. I've done press runs, I've, done, I've been a proofreader, a typesetter, uh, 
delivered the newspapers to the newsstands. I've um, been an editor and uh, more, mostly, uh, most importantly, have been uh, a writer for all this time. And the reason I got into the Underground Railroad subject was because it was a newspaper assignment. Uh, the editor said, hey, you want to do a fluff piece on this uh, Underground Railroad safe house in Haverhill, New Hampshire, called the Bliss Tavern. So I did that piece, and, well, you mean there were freedom seekers that were fleeing slavery up in New Hampshire? Were they in Vermont? Well, that just started the beginning of a very long research project that still hasn't ended. So that's where I just started researching and researching before the internet, when you had to go to each town and library and read their town town histories there, uh, and you couldn't just Google everything. So that's where I started, and I just continued to forge ahead. And Vermont was very interesting because, because the fact that the biggest misconceptions about the Underground Railroad is that as so, uh, when freedom seekers got as far north as Vermont or New Hampshire, they were safe. It was utopia. They could live here and be happy and live happily ever after. So that was that was that was what we all grew up learning, and that there really wasn't any underground railroad um, history in Vermont. And I was told that very specifically by state historians and um, historical. Uh, groups that this was just a bunch of legend that you're dealing with. Um, to me, history is a mystery and there are clues. And the first clues in Underground Railroad are the houses everybody talks about. This house on this street, my grandmother said this was where they hid runaway slaves. So those, that's the first clue. And then you, the next clue is who lived in that house, who helped them. Well, it turns out that the Underground Railroad was a network of people who were helping freedom seekers move through to Canada for the most part. They wanted to move where it was safe in the 1800s before uh, abolition of slavery in our country. And so it was in every state. It didn't stop at the, at the New York border to Vermont. And the more I researched, the more I found that um, history happened right here. It happened right in my town. It happened everywhere. And it was just a matter of digging it and, and then putting all the clues together. And sometimes it's not all documented. But how much of our history is oral history? And how much of the generational stories are passed on? Because, you know, I, we all live in towns that you know, have people who have been there, their family has been there since it was founded. My Newbury was founded by my husband's um, ancestor, Jacob Bailey. So we all have generational history. So that history happened. We had blacks living in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire. We had slaves who lived in Vermont and New Hampshire. So we're going to do like a crash course. Uh, there is so much information about this subject, um, this time frame, that uh, we could be here every Wednesday, not Tuesday, uh, we could be here every Wednesday for probably six months and I still would not touch on everything there is out there and the things that I don't know. So there, it's always being revealed. So misconceptions. When the Civil War started, it was always thought that all Northerners were against slavery and that they all wanted to uh, free the slaves and have them all be their equals and live all in this perfect harmony. <laughs> and that's not true. <laughs> that was not the case. Uh, there were a lot of people who were, were for getting rid of slavery in our country, and they wanted to have people to have the rights that everyone else had. But that was not the case in New England, and it definitely wasn't the case in Vermont either, or New Hampshire. There was no state in, in the North that was fighting the you know that was specifically fighting the Civil War to free slaves. Uh, I've done all I've 
went down many trails of Civil War history research, and I've written a lot, uh, hands-on um, transcribing diaries and journals, and that just wasn't what the soldiers were talking about. So you had persecution of free blacks in the North and in Vermont, Jeffrey Brace um, and uh, different specific uh, records that we have of that. Um, there was no justice or freedom. There was always a fear. Because even if you were born free... Oh, I gave myself two minutes. <laughs> okay, we won't go by that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so even if you were born free, if your parents were free and you were a person of color, you still had to worry. Because this is a really paradoxical kind of time frame that pre-Civil War because you had people who lived as free people of color all over the North, but then you had people who were fugitives who were had made it North and decided to settle North, and so they were living in cities and towns. And then you also had this fear that, you know, if you made the wrong move and made your neighbor angry, he could turn around and say, well, he's a slave. He's a runaway. And have that person picked up by the authorities and then and taken into, you know, sold into slavery. Or you had a fear. Nobody was safe if you were a black person in this time frame, before the Civil War, 1820s up to 1860s, okay? Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, they all were always watching over their shoulder because they didn't trust anybody, and very likely so. So you had this. It was a very confusing, tense time, and I'm and we have to step away from the whole 19th century being like um, you know being like Jane Austen time frame. Your Victorian, you know, I'm a huge Jane Austen fan. So you got to step away from all that civility and properness, and you have to realize it was a very violent time. And the other thing that um, makes it for researching, made researching difficult for me, was that so much of the history of before the Civil War, if it had anything to do with slavery or blacks living in town, anything to do that was negative, it, after the Civil War, your town histories were all written, 1880s, 1890s, and whoever wrote them decided how the history was going to be. They decided who, what the narrative would be. So guess what they decided to omit, erase, rewrite? In New Hampshire, it wasn't known until the 1990s that there was a black heritage history in New Hampshire. The history in New Hampshire the blacks who had lived there, the slaves who had been owned, the slave trade that was there, it, that existed up until the 1800s, was all rewritten or erased. It's a very similar parallel to my Egyptian research, where you had pharaohs who were, their names were erased and their monuments tore, taken down by, the, by their, uh, you know, their, their successor and erase them from history. King Tut wasn't even known for 3,000 years. So this isn't an American thing. And I thought about that when I was driving down here. I went, you know, this isn't, you know, exclusive for New England to make it look like all the southern states were bad and the northern states were good. This is, this is just human nature. This is, this is called human history, okay? So but what did I say? I said, oh, New Hampshire. Yes, New Hampshire didn't ha know up until the 1990s that they had uh, blacks living in their state. Even more so, with Portsmouth being a shipbuilding community, the ships that were built were financed by Portsmouth merchants, and they were sent where to get imports? Africa, the Ivory Coast. You have the cargo included the spices and, and all the things that they were getting overseas, they were also buying slaves, and those slaves were sold on the trip north, and when they got to New Hampshire, they still had um, auctions for slaves in Portsmouth, 1600s through the 1800s. Did you know that? 
This is an amazing thing. It is, there are, there are like hundreds and hundreds of um, ads in the New Hampshire Gazette about um, auctioning off, um, right here, a likely Negro girl. She was part of the oxen, the sheep, and the steers, and a good horse. So this was a common thing in, in New Hampshire, and it was also common in Vermont, even though we like to think we were the anti-slavery state we abolished slavery first. We're, you know, Vermont had this pristine reputation, but we know that's not actually true when there were slaves that were held. Yes, here in Vermont. We're not talking about 300 slaves owned by someone. We're talking about maybe two. Someone to help in the carpentry shop, someone to help with blacks, the smith, in the blacksmith shop, someone to help on the farm if you didn't have a, you know, six boys to help, right? So slavery happened here. This here, well, that's not working. Uh, this here is was dated 1793 here in Springfield, where a slave was purchased. Um, and over there on the that, um, well, obviously it's transcribed because it's typed. But Jotham White sells sells a slave to someone. So you had slavery here in Springfield. It did happen here. This was the time frame. There was also Colonel John Barrett who lived in Springfield and he, he purchased uh, uh, Rose in 1770 and she was his. These are names that you probably are familiar with. Jotham White, uh, he's the one that sold Dinah to Stephen Jacobs in Windsor. And that was where Dinah was a slave woman who by the time she got older, um, and infirm that Stephen Jacob says, well, kicked her out on the street. And the town said, you can't do that. You know, you can't do that. And so he, it went to the court system and the town ended up uh, um, taking care of Dinah. Um, but you have different instances where slavery actually happened. Right here in Springfield, right in all the towns in, uh, in Vermont and New Hampshire. So that brings us to the Underground Railroad. We're not doing a talk on just slavery in, in these two states, okay? What we want to do is we want to explore what this Underground Railroad network was, why there are so many mix misconceptions about it, and also, was it really that important to be secret about it? Because some people argue that. Um, Well, we'll wait for the curtains. Okay, so let's set a stage. If, if everybody in the North was not against slavery, that meant that if you were against slavery and you stood up and you, you were verbal and said, I want to get rid of it, you would be talking about shaking a constitutional right. <laughs> Slave owners had a constitutional right to own slaves. It was in there. And so if you stood up and said, we want to change the Constitution, you were not a, not a very from, uh, favorite person in town, okay? So the more you stood up and, and wanted to shake things up, the more you were a radical. You were more unpatriotic. You were a traitor because you wanted to change the Constitution. So um, in the about 1840s is when this whole movement of the abolition abolition movement where you had uh, William Lloyd Garrison out of Boston with his uh, Liberator newspaper, what he was doing was, let's go out and we're going to teach people how bad slavery is so that they will join our forces to get rid of it. But we're not, we're, we're going to go and be in your face. We're not just going to be nice about it. We're going to go into your towns and we're going to lecture and we're going to tell you how bad it is. Well, I guess that wouldn't be very popular. I don't think they'd get a room full. Because people just didn't want to hear it. They don't want to change stuff. Things are okay. It doesn't bother us because we're in New England. You're talking about Georgia, it's North Carolina. That's like a whole other continent, isn't it? <laughs> when I moved up here from Pennsylvania, they thought that Vermont was another continent. It was <laughs> okay? So you had people who just talking about it. Fred Douglas, Frederick Douglass, after he had fled slavery himself, 
he was his life mission was to abolish slavery and to go tell everybody about it. His first public um, talk was in Pitts, uh, Pittsfield, New Hampshire. He wrote. He started one his first of three autobiographies in in Ware, New Hampshire. And he, I'm. This is going in my newspaper next week. In October of 1860, Frederick Douglass was visiting a, a minister in Topsom, Vermont. I don't know if anybody's heard of that place. Okay, Topsom, it's near Bradford, which is where my newspaper is. And uh, this minister what, organized all of these abolitionist talk speakers to come and talk. And Frederick Douglass was in Bradford in October, on October 20th. Oh, we're pretty close. On October 20th, up for a two-day convention, he was in our town. I know exactly where he was. The building's not there, but... The point is, is that you had tension. There was so much tension and so many people in one town, in every town in New Hampshire and Vermont, who had their strong opinions and they didn't want to hear yours and they were like divided, right? So, the more you talk about not shaking things up, the more people aren't going to like it, okay? So, for example, in Brattleboro, we have two sides here going on. We have Charles and his brother Willard Frost, who were helping runaway slaves, freedom seekers. They were helping them at, at Charles's house, secretly. Why was this secret? Well, just in his own town, the local minister, Reverend Edward Tyler, decided to do lectures at the Elliott Chapel about, against slavery. This is, Charles and Willard probably went to this, these talks. Well, the minister, not a visitor, not a lecturer, he didn't travel to go talk. He was the minister in Brattleboro, and do you, this is not an exaggeration, um, uh, Abigail Hemingway wrote about this, that when Tyler um, in 1837 was doing this talk, you had locals that set up a cannon out in front of the church doors. And they kept saying, we're going to tar and feather that preacher. We're going to blow that damn ab abolitionist down the bank. Fire that cannon. How is that not violent? <laughs> How, if that happened today, I'd my editor would be on it, the photographers would be there, they'd be interviewing people, and Tyler would be in the church going, I don't know what he did, <laughs> right? The local minister was, okay, they did fire the cannon. They didn't kill anybody, and no, they didn't blow him down a bank, but they sure did make a whole lot of smoke. <coughs> it messed up everything in the church, okay? That was happening in Brattleboro, 1837. Do you think that Charles and Willard Frost are going to go to the general store or the post office to the next day and say, you know, I helped some people last night. You know who they were? I don't think so. I don't think so. Now, the Underground Railroad, I hope I'm not yelling. Is this okay? Okay. The Underground Railroad has, it, it's really confusing uh, because there's a lot of stories that stretch the truth, and then there's also misconceptions about what the Underground Railroad was. It wasn't a train. It wasn't something you bought a ticket to down south, and it would take uh, runaways north. It was a network of people, and sometimes trains were used, and the, the lingo of railroad came from the fact that in the 1840s, what hit America? The railroad did. Everything was railroad. Everything was, it was crossing the country. Our country was growing. We were moving westward, and we were building trains. The buzzword was that. It would be like today if we said that, you know, if you use terms like zooming. Who knew what zooming was before 2020, okay? I never did that before, don't like it, okay? Don't like the whole Zoom thing. Um, bad enough seeing yourself, okay? It's like being filmed. Okay, no, it's, it, was, it was the time frame, railroad, conductors, 
uh, baggage, baggages, um, packages, depots. It was lingo. People would understand. And it was about people helping. A lot of times in the South, you did have to have freedom seekers be given instructions, specifically go to this place because that this person will help you. But in my research for 30 plus years, when they got to Vermont or New Hampshire, this was like the Arctic to them. This was like a whole other world. And you couldn't just give directions. So what they would do is, it was all about conveyance. You would take somebody to a, the next safe place. It was, you would put them in a wagon, you would hide them, you would put them in a carriage. Maybe you wouldn't hide them that day. Maybe it didn't seem that tense that day. But basically, it was a way of fighting slavery by helping a few get out away from slavery. And as far as I know, it's a rough count. It was a rough count in, in the 1850s. 40,000 refugees were in Canada, like in Quebec, who were former slaves. So that means that that many made it. They didn't all make it, but so, and the reason Canada was, was the target, it was because there was no, it was British, it was owned by the British Empire, so no slavery there. So that's free, and you can't go across the border and take somebody, okay? But in Vermont, New Hampshire, I found instance after instance, per people after people actually helping people, uh, fugitive slaves. And of course, my journey, my history mystery all usually starts with a house. And so I go to my maps, and you've seen me with my maps, the Beers and the Wallings maps in the 18, from like 1850 up to 1880s, they used to write, they would put down who lived where and what was where. So you got a, a landscape of a town by these maps, and they're great for researching. Who lived there? That's how I figure stuff out. So I would figure out a house, and these are all in Vermont. This is Bigelow House in, in Burlington. This is um, uh, Hutchinson House on the Green in Woodstock. That's the Converse House uh, in uh, Burlington. That's a brick tunnel entry that's in my town. Um, Elmer Brown Nursery is over there in uh, Thetford Center, over there top right, the brick. So you had houses, but we need to zoom in on this. We need to find out who the people were. And that's one of the things that is really interesting to me, is that these people knew each other. It wasn't just happenstance. It wasn't like, well, I think that person's nice. I think if I send them to you, you'll help. No, they all were part of the same uh, clubs, organizations. They were either part of the same churches or family. There was a Vermont anti-slavery society, and they all belonged to it. So when I look at a when I look at a um, a roll call and the minutes of an 1841 annual meeting of the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society in attendance are all of these people that I recognize from my research. So all of these people, they would know about a meeting, they would go to a meeting, and this was a general anti-slavery society. It wasn't an Underground Railroad thing. It was, how do we fight abolition on, uh, on our local level? And they had these, I think by 1840s, you probably had about 100 of these uh, societies within Vermont. The same with New Hampshire, and, and this was a, an, or, you know, an organization. But within, they'd go to these and they'd know each other. Well, Lawrence Brainerd is in St. Albans. He traveled all the way to Rochester, Vermont to go to this meeting. And he would meet up with Joseph Poland. He would know him. So that's the connections they had this way. So that they would go, you know, but they wouldn't talk about it at the meetings. This was private, it was quiet, but they knew each other. And the, the key word, trust. Because during pre-Civil War, you couldn't trust anybody. You don't know who was a secessionist, you didn't know who, it was just like the Revolutionary War and you didn't know, you know, who was a Tory and who was, who, you know, who was a colonist, okay? These people all knew each other somehow. 
And if they had, didn't know them directly in person, they knew of them. And so they would know who to trust. But there, look at all these names. You saw all those faces. These are all people who really helped with this cause. Um, the most famous and well-known is Roland and Rachel Robinson Ferrisburg. Um, their home, they helped hundreds and hundreds of freedom seekers. And sometimes they stayed for a while. Sometimes they stayed for a couple months and helped on the farm. Well, it's Ferrisburg. I don't know if you've ever been to Ferrisburg. Well, it's flat, and it just is flat for miles until you get to Lake Champlain. The mountains are over this way. But over near Lake Champlain, it's flat. And there's like, you could be out in a field at Rokeby working for Ro uh, Rowland Ro Roland Robinson, and you wouldn't be able to see a soul because they'd be so far out, okay? So sometimes secrecy was necessary, sometimes it was not. Um, but we need to. We need to meet people. I can't, I, I can't introduce everybody to you, but I'm going to try to give you some examples. Family connections. You'd have brothers, you'd have uncles, you'd have, um, you know, a sister, you'd have a, a cousin. If you knew that they would help, okay? In this instance, we had um, Titus Hutchinson, who was a Supreme Court judge in Vermont, um, he moonlighted as a, an Underground Railroad agent in Woodstock, right smack dab in the middle of Woodstock, right on the green. You can see the house now. And there was a, 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 a large walk-in closet on the second floor where they would hide freedom seekers during the day until it was safe to move them on. Well, he had a son who lived in Chester. Oramel. I hope you can see Oramel. Oramel lived in Chester, Vermont. And he was an agent in Chester. So he would send, he knew he could trust his dad, and he would take them to Woodstock by wagon or however, carriage, and he would take them to his dad's place because he knew he could trust him to move and Titus would move them on, okay? But nowhere in Titus Hutchins' accolades as a Supreme Court judge does it ever say that. It's never written out. And Ormel, his, he lived in right here in Chester. I, have a I thought I found his name on the map the other night, and then I lost it. So <laughs> I'll have to look again. And I do, not, I do not stand up front. I'm not an expert on Springfield history. I'm not an expert on every town. I only know the ones that I have researched, and so that's what I share with you. Um, and I'm telling you, there's still so much more every week. I'm, I'm being fed more information, so I need to get writing books, but <sighs> <laughs> that weekly uh, deadline's tough. Um, okay, so we have family connections. We have um, connections through churches, like the Robinsons in Ferrisburg, well, they were Quakers. You, you know you, can stay, you could stay in the 1800s, you could stay in a Quaker home from Pennsylvania all the way to the Canadian border every night, you could stay in one, and they all, you know how that would work? I mean, my family's Mennonites. Well, the Mennonites could do the same thing. They could travel from Lancaster, Pennsylvania up to Vermont and stay in somebody else's house who's a Mennonite. Connections. I know you, I trust you, I would send this person to you, I would pass on this person, and your job is to pass them onward to someone else. And that's what it was about. So we have connections. We have, this wasn't just sending somebody and having somebody, oh, don't knock on that, um, <laughs> and answering that door about 10 o'clock at night, and it's snowing, and you answer the door, and there's... There's this runaway in tatters and answering that door and taking them in and feeding and clothing them and giving them uh, a bed to sleep in and then trying to figure out what you're going to do the next night. It wasn't always like that. A lot of it was the connections. And you're still doing the same thing where you get the knock on the door and it's, you know, it's Oramel Hutchinson from Chester knocking on Noah Safford's door here in Springfield saying, uh, here, can you help these people tonight? 
Sure thing. So here's another example. We know that some of the freedom seekers would stay in stay in the uh, town in the north. A lot of times they would stay because they felt that it would they would be welcomed. A lot of times they weren't. Sometimes things would change and they would end up having to leave. But I know that um, John White. This is not his portrait, um, but this is a you know just a representation. So John White was born. Um, in Virginia, around Bermuda 100, he was a slave. And he ran away after he was told by his master he wasn't allowed to go see his wife and children anymore. And so he decided he was going to not be told what to do, so he fled. And he, he worked his way from Virginia up through the Hudson Valley in New York with people helping, agents of the Underground Railroad, and he ended up being taken to Manchester to, um, and I was going to look it up and I can't remember, but I, to an agent in Manchester. Another agent, Daniel Roberts, helped him but um, didn't receive him at first, so he decided to stay. And he got a home, he got a job, he helped at the church, he got, he got married he, to Polly and they had a daughter, he was part of the census in 1860, he, he made a life here, even though he was a fugitive slave, and he didn't tell anybody, the only two people in, that, in Manchester, Vermont, who knew he had, was a former slave, were the two men that helped him get there. He would not tell anyone for fear of um, being captured or someone's ratting him out. Well, how do I know that? How do I know that his name was Cyrus Branch, a.k.a. John White? How do I know he escaped from Virginia? He decided it was five, no, it was four years after the Civil War that he decided it was safe to go public. And he worked with um, Elizabeth Wickham, who was in Springfield, went to church with John, and he had her help write a little pamphlet about his life. And it explained where he grew up, how he escaped, all the things he went through, the horrible things he went through, hiding out in swamps, getting bit, almost dying in the swamps, and then making his way and someone helping him finally, and then finally getting to Manchester. He wrote this pamphlet and had, and they printed up copies. Why? Not because he wanted, you know, to be interviewed on CNN or CNS, NBC. No, he wanted to raise money because he left his family down there, and he had a new family. But he wanted to reunite, and that's what he did. So he ended up getting enough funding so that he could go down to the same area and at this now where slavery's over and he did reunite with his daughters that he had left behind. His wife had passed in the interim. We know his story because he documented it and it's out there and we can read it. I mean, and so we know that and he felt safe enough to, sit, to stay but he kept that secret. So let's Zoom in on Springfield, because that's where we're here, right? We're here. Uh, we're here in Springfield. There, the thing about this subject, the thing about the books that I've done, is that they're teasers. There's so much information. But the books, when you write for Arcadia, it's formula writing. So X amount of words, X amount of pages, X amount of pictures. And you really have to sift down, sift through, and figure out, well, who can I tell them about? So the books are a good, you know, a good sampling of examples, but there's so much more, and that's why I come and I just talk to people. <laughs> I share things this way, because, but it, there really is so much out there. And so um, that's why we'll kind of just, you'll get a taste of, of each. Um, now this map here, you see it zooms in, Springfield's up there, across from Quaker City, by the way, and uh, there's North Springfield, and we'll work our way over here, there's Jamaica, 
Manchester's over this way. So this map I have posted over there near the table. Um, it was made by Professor Wilbur Siebert um, out of Ohio University um, in the early 1900s. Now Siebert spent his life researching the Underground Railroad across the whole country, all the northern states. And he did, um, he reached out to historians and librarians and anybody he could get to talk to him about, do you know anything about the Underground Railroad going through your town? And a lot of times he would come up with, he would actually get letters from people who actually helped these freedom seekers or the children who remember what dad or mom did. So we have first-hand or second-hand knowledge. So he made this great map. He's done it for Ohio and, you know, he, you can check out Seabird. But this map here, the red lines are his. I didn't do that, okay? I printed them off. But you'll see that the red line goes, it, it was the Fitchburg down there up to Walpole. That was the Fitchburg Railroad at the time. And then you see the red line goes straight up. Looks like it's right through the ri river. <laughs> and it goes right through Springfield. You see that? It goes boom, right up through. But what he, he did, these maps, he would point out different things. He would be like, I know specifically in this town, in Weir, New Hampshire, that definitely someone was an agent there. Or in Manchester, I definitely know someone, or in Woodstock. So he was very specific, okay? So in Springfield, I'd like to introduce you to Noah and Nancy Safford, which you probably already know them. Um, I've researched Noah and Nancy since the 1990s, and um, I, have, I have some posters here. Uh, the incredible uh, work that Noah and Nancy did helping uh, freedom seekers, but also he, he was like the found, part of the foundation of industry here in Springfield. Uh, at, with I, after Isaac Fisher, he was the one that started building up with the foundry and then he had a manufacturing uh, company and he kept adding to manufacturing and as, as the industries grew here in town, he was one of them, one of the founders. He lived, um, well that's jumping ahead of myself, um, he invented a straw cutter that revolutionized, it had gears and it had metal versus wood, and he, he got patents for it, and he started manufacturing it, started selling it in, out of Boston and Massachusetts um, outlets, and it was so popular that he actually went south to Richmond, Virginia, and started selling it down there. He would ship these, these straw cutter machines down to Richmond, and someone there that he knew from Springfield, Hiram Moore, would receive them, put them all together, and then Noah would spend the winters in Virginia selling them. So very, you know, entrepreneur, very, very real go-getter. What did he experience when he was down in Virginia? First hand, uh, first eyewitness accounts of what slavery really was like. Because, you know, you get a bit complacent if you live this far north and you don't ever see a person of color. You get very complacent and very lackadaisical about it. It's like me in the news. I mean, I've read, I've, I've been, I was a proofreader at, you know, 20 years old, I'm a proofreader of national news. You kind of jade you a little bit. You don't trust anybody. But you also read, you also are not surprised at anything, how awful some things are. Because, well, that's the news. But... He saw this stuff firsthand. He saw auction blocks. He saw people being sold. And that just totally transformed his way of thinking. And he and would come home and tell Nancy, we're going to start being proactive. We are going to help people. And he started getting involved. His, uh, on Clinton Street, Clinton Street, and then you take uh, Bridge Street. Go, it's right near the Edgar May building. If you're driving on Bridge Street before you cross the Black River, on the right in the parking lot is where his house was, next to um, Hiram Whitmore's at this time, not now. And then his barn. He, he would hide people in his barn or he'd hide them in his attic. 
And this was the foundry that's actually behind where the Edgar May Center is. And he, after he sold it, it became the Vermont Snaith Company. And yes, I do know what a Snaith is. Okay. <laughs> All right, he knows. <laughs> you can ask him. <laughs> uh, so the foundry, that's right. They have competitions at, uh, yeah, it's a handle of a site. Uh, so here's it. So this is, that's, that's the other side, not the Edgar May building, but the brick building. The foundry was right on the river, and then you see where that blue vehicle is, that's where Noah's house was. <laughs> so John Swanson took me there a couple years ago, and we figured it out by the maps. I parked right where Noah lived. <laughs> so this was an amazing thing that he did, and we know he did this because his daughter, Rebecca Safford Holmes, shared this with the historian at the time. Mary um, Eva Baker, and she shared about hearing wagons, when she was a girl, wagons would come at night to their house, pull up to the house, and her dad would go out, and there'd be all, then she'd know her mom was making food. It's the middle of the night. She's making food for somebody, and Noah would take it out, and it would be freedom seekers. He would be keeping the barn for the night. Maybe he'd move them into the house later, if they had to stay longer, if he couldn't make a connection right away. So we know that he was doing this and people knew he was doing this. Noah was a very industrialist uh, man in Springfield, but he also was not well liked because he was a mover and a shaker. He boycotted products made from slave power. He boycotted the American board because they, uh, had, they were connected to churches that had slaveholders in their membership. He wasn't afraid to stand up and speak his mind, and they all knew it. So, one of the exa another example is here in Springfield. You have you have a runaway who decided who came up through being passed along from agent to agent, and he was brought to Noah Safford's house. He was brought by wagon, but he didn't go any farther. He decided to stay. He, Noah said, why don't you just try it? You know, you, you, you know, you could get a job, you know, you could, you could start a new life here. And his name was Ephraim Wright. And Ephraim Wright was born in Maryland or Georgia, uh, Virginia, depends on which census you look at, and um, decided to stay here. And he got married in 1848 to Mary, who lived in Claremont. She was a free, uh, free black. And her parent, I think one of her parents was a, was free. The other might have been a fugitive. Um, but they got married, and he started a life here. He may have had a wife and kids down south. I don't know, because he was like 39 by the time he got married to Mary. And he's in the Springfield census. There's Ephraim Wright in there, and, and he's a laborer. He has property. Do you see the number? He has property that's worth value. He lives with Mary Ann, his wife. His daughter, Mary J., who's six months old, and his mother-in-law, Nancy Thomas. And she was 62, and you see, it says he's mulatto, M. The rest of the, the women are, were considered black, B. And where did they live? Well, Noah Safford helped them get a house, and they lived on South Street. So there's some kind of recreational center on South Street today, and it's in... It's, oh, there, it's called Springfield Community something, with the big red dot. Well, the house just beyond that is that house on, over there, and that was, that was where Ephraim and Mary's house was. Obviously, this one has been rebuilt. This one was built in the 1880s, and that's not when Ephraim lived in it. So, um, and the, the house is on the map, and we know it as it, back in the 18... What was that map? 1859, it was the J. Norse house. It was, it was a Norse house at the time. But none of us were around then, so we don't know the Norses. <laughs> okay? But anyway, so that house is, that location is where Ephraim lived. And he worked here. He lived here. Um, there's, uh, 
We know that he did own the property. He's in the Lister's appraisal record for 1854 on South Street. We know he's in the uh, Springfield census. We know they were property owners. They joined the first congregational church. Um, they, they had two children. Their son died at 20. And they eventually moved out of Springfield after Noah and Nancy had died. And they moved to Gardner, Mass. And that's where I picked up. That's where I found him. Is he was in Gardner, Mass. And he died. He was working there. And he had his wife there, his daughter, who had two children. So he's a grandpa. And, well, Mary, Mary was a grandma. And his mother-in-law lived there a little while with him until she passed. And they, so their life, um, the ark goes to Gardner, Mass, and they died there. I don't know where they're buried exactly. But he had a whole full life here. And part of it is thanks to someone taking the time and helping him, Noah and Nancy. Okay, so we got to move along. All right, so we do have some other uh, on some other agents that I don't have um, information or time to share about. Um, the Cranes, they were doctors, uh, Eliza and Henry Crane in Springfield. They were. That's a, a local tradition local legend I heard about, and Deacon Durant Boynton, who owned this Durant Mill in North Springfield, it's on, and he lived on School Street, and he was one, he would receive, no one, Nancy would, would take uh, Freedom Seekers to uh, Boynton's house. So like I said, everything's connected. All these people knew each other. Um, we had Daniel Roberts, who helped John White in Manchester. He would send freedom seekers to Oromel Hutchins in Chester. Uh, Oromel would send them to Noah Safford sometimes, or to his dad. And then Noah would send them either to Durant Boynton's place, or to Judge William Pingree's in Perkinsville. And then they would either send them up to Colonel Thomas Powers in South Woodstock and move them on. See how it works? You just kept moving them on. You're getting closer, further north. And you just kept on going. So I'm watching the time, so, right? Um, okay, so that's just a smattering of this area. There's a whole state to go through. <laughs> and there's an awful lot of great people that you need to meet. And all you have to do is just start checking it out online. Definitely buy a book, because <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> um, in New Hampshire, I did cross over, because I live in Newbury, and I, and which is right on the Connecticut River, and New Hampshire is right there. So everything you do, your banking and your grocery shopping is in New Hampshire. So uh, I obviously covered a lot of towns in New Hampshire. And a lot of agents, okay? A lot of people. Center Harbor, in Canaan, in Lyme. Concord, Littleton, all of these people, they were all helping. And a lot of, I don't have a lot of women's pictures. I have some women's pictures, but I had to be brief for today. But a lot of times you don't, when you're, you know, the town histories don't always have the women's, you know, okay. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, you know. It's who, who's doing the narrative, you know? Who did all the work, the women, you know, the men wrote the narrative. Okay, no slams. Sorry, guys. Uh, so here's a woman <laughs> in Peterborough. We have Abigail and Moses Cheney. They lived in Peterborough and also uh, for a time lived in Ashland, which is further north, closer to me. That's just south of Plymouth. And this is the home that they lived in. We know that for, they, we know about his uh, Moses and Abigail helping freedom seekers because their children wrote them, told on them. <laughs> uh, they wrote Wil Wilbur Siebert, the professor, all about dad having a, spe a, a secret room in the basement and helping, um, helping freedom seekers hide out and then taking them to, to the next place. Uh, a very frequent visitor when he was in New Hampshire was Frederick Douglass, and he stayed at the Cheney house. Um, it, this this was all they were all connected as he went around lecturing so we know in Peterborough that there that there was uh, a, there were agents there and more um, and this 
there are different instances. So we have Underground Railroad agents. Then we also have um, uh, blacks that lived in New Hampshire. We ha I gave you two examples of Vermont. Now we have three examples in New Hampshire, and I can just do a look over, okay? Definitely look into Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Amos Fortune, there's Amos Fortune House, there's Amos Fortune Road. Uh, the Jaffrey Library has a huge collection of documents from the 1700s of Amos Fortune, who was a slave in Woburn, Mass, until he bought his freedom, and then he bought his wife's freedom, Violet's, and they moved to Jaffrey, New Hampshire, because they wanted opportunity and they wanted to start a life. And this is a good story and interesting because this community embraced them, didn't chase them out. Well, okay. When they first showed up in town, they were warned out, which was pretty common if you look like a poor white or if you were a person of color. The select board at this time would meet you, at, you know, meet you in the center of town and say, you're not welcome here. <laughs> they really legally did that. And, but Amos didn't care, he stayed. And he was befriended by the minister. He ended up setting up a tannery business. He was so good, he had customers traveling from Massachusetts up to Jaffrey just, just to have his work done. He had apprentices. He was training young white boys in Jaffrey the tanning business. He actually retired. This is a very successful person who made a life here and he had been a slave. He wasn't a runaway, but he still, he, he was welcome there. Do you know that he, that he bequeathed money to the local school and to form a library in Jaffrey when he died? And he and Violet's uh, gravestones are in the Jaffrey Church uh, graveyard and they're actually, facsimiles are in the Smithsonian because they're huge. They're huge slate, and they stand like this high and this wide, and it tells their story. Born a slave, you know, lived a free man, you know, and it, he and his wife's gravestones, they're very monumental. They still were at the back of the graveyard at the time, and that's a whole other subject um, about class distinction in graveyards, but you can have somebody else come. I have connections. I got somebody who did a good book on it. Okay, uh, all right, so that's Amos Fortune. Check it out. There was a book written in 1950, uh, a fictional novel written about him that's, that, yeah. Amos Fortune's Three Names? Yes, yes. And I just, and it, um, Eliz Elizabeth somebody, um, Elizabeth, can't remember. But I just found a, a first edition in a local library up my way. Snag it. Um, okay, the other one you want to do is you want to check out Harry Wilson in Milford, New Hampshire. That's not that far away from here. She was the daughter of a, a white man and a, a black woman. They were poor, and she was, uh, at six years old, was made an indentured servant of a family in Milford. And that was pretty typical of poor kids, okay? That's pretty typical of the time frame, 1800s. But her life was wrought with abuse from the woman of the house. And she was treated like a slave and treated like a non-human. Well, when she got it, became of age, she split, because <laughs> she could, 18. And she decided to write a story about her life. But she fictionalized it. And nobody knew that a woman in Milford, New Hampshire, wrote, a, uh, <laughs> wrote an autobiography until uh, Professor... Henry Louis Gates figured it out here back in the 1980s that this was a real story about a real New Hampshire town and these were real people. And it was, it's an incredible book, but it is the life of this young woman. Definitely check her out. I, I had a little bit in my, I have uh, this, a little bit in my book about her. And then you have the famous uh, Oni Judge Staines. Martha Washington's uh, personal assistant, um, how she was a slave at Mount Vernon and then at the presidential house in Philadelphia, and how she ran away and made a life in New Hampshire. Came by ship, landed in Portsmouth, and ended up living, oh, 
pretty, she lived a free, free life even though she was a fugitive and even though George Washington was very persistent and tried to send agents up here to get her and take her home. Her story's amazing. There's a book called Never Caught uh, by um, Erica Dunbar. Fantastic book. So that's just snippets, okay? Because I was told I could only have you here for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> An hour is long enough. Um, but the thing about this is that there always, there's always new things happening. There's always new things being discovered. They're still finding um, new. They're still finding tombs in Egypt. So we have a whole long ways to go here. Okay. Um, so in East Andover, New Hampshire, there is a house that um, there was a chimney in the attic that had a partition around it that runaways could hide in when it was appropriate and someone who was hiding um, was there for a little while and got some paints and actually those paintings are on that white chimney they're fantastic artwork dated even 1845 oh that's that's just a historian's dream or a dollhouse that was made that is at the New Hampshire Historical Society in their museum where you turn it around and it's it's the inside of this little cabin and it has little black dolls in it and it was made for um, Nathaniel and Armenia White's daughter and they were Underground Railroad agents and a fugitive was staying with them and he made this for their daughter and it was found and given to the um, this, these are just, these are interesting things, besides a tunnel or a, high, a secret room. Um, or the slave petition that was found in a filing cabinet in Concord. In 1779, 20 Portsmouth slaves, because there were over, there were hundreds living in Portsmouth in the 1600s. 20 of them got together, they were literate, they wrote up a petition after, um, the Declaration of Independence and said, hey, you guys just, we, we fought for your freedom. You just got freedom. How about us? 1779, why don't you give us our freedom? It's our God-given right. And they actually had the guts to sneak away from their owners to go to, it was Exeter at the time, capital. It was Exeter, not Concord at the time. And they actually went and they presented it to the legislature. Wow. There was no press there. There was nobody doing stories on it. This thing went, they looked at it and went, yeah, yeah, we'll come back to it, we'll table it. And guess where it ended up? Not in a trash can, it ended up in a filing cabinet. And it wasn't found until, the, um, what, 2005, maybe? It was found in the 2000s, I'm pretty sure. This stuff is amazing. And it's always, there's something always new coming up and about somebody who helped uh, these strangers who needed to get away from slavery. Um, the last one I'm going to tell you of is this This one's a little more stark. It's not a dollhouse. It's not a book. It's not, you know, a carved a carved knife or, or walking stick. Um, back in 2001, Steve, the Leninskys were building an addition onto their um, old farmhouse uh, on it's in Red it was in Reading, now it's called South Woodstock. Um, and when they dug down underneath the north the uh, granite slab, which was the northeast step, uh, they hit metal. And so they dug down further and unearthed this piece of metal, this ring. It's this big. And they cleaned it off. It had marks on it. It came around, it had a hasp. It, it's this big. It's a collar. It goes around your neck. It was buried underneath a granite slab when the house was built in 1814. And so they had it, you know, checked out. They had it at uh, Columbia University. They had it checked out by uh, antique dealers and stuff. This is real. It's heavy. It's iron. It's, it, it's cast. It, it, it's not something somebody just made and, oh, let's make some money on it. So Steve, let me see this collar. I went to the house, the same farmhouse that it was buried at, and it's frightening. 
Because when you hold it, it's like, whoa, chills. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. And my friend was with me, and she put it on. <gasps> and it's heavy. She said the weight, the way it cut into her, you know, a, even though a woman, but even a man, the weight of it. Now, we don't know its story. We don't know who had it on. I guarantee it's not something that someone kept as a souvenir from being a slave. All I know is that it was buried. You don't want anybody to know about it. Two, someone, if they had it, they wouldn't be carrying it from the south up to the north and then decide to hide it. So I'm thinking they had it on. I'm just making this up, but I don't know. I also know that if it has a hasp and it's around your neck, I can't even put a necklace on without help. How do you get a cast iron collar off if it's, a ta if it's the hasp and it's together? Someone had to do that. Someone had to break it, right? The chain, the cat, right? Someone helped them. And then someone said, we got to get rid of this. And they buried it because they were building this house. Now, the only thing I do know is that right around this Henry Walker farm were the Burdu families. There were two brothers who were black families who had moved to Woodstock, uh, to Reading, and they had bought property, a lot of property. And they had come from like the Warner area, and they came up here and they bought property. And then the men of the household died. And the land didn't go to the wives or the kids. It was absorbed by the white neighbors. And one of the Burdue's children, Silas, at eight years old, went to work at the Henry Walker farm. Now, I don't know if Silas helped somebody. I don't know if Henry helped somebody. I do know that he was not a slave. I do know that he was held in high regard because he's buried in the family plot up the road right next to Henry Walker and his wife. Silas, Henry, and his wife. Very nice stone, by the way. Which is very unusual for people of color in the 1800s. They usually weren't even given a stone, and they usually weren't even buried within walls. Consecrated ground. They usually were outside of it. I don't know the story. I don't know if Silas helped somebody. I don't know if Henry did. All I know is that that collar is real, and that's history. And that's the great thing about it, is that it's a mystery that we don't know the answer to. Maybe somebody will find a journal that will tell me about it, or to tell you about it, and then you call me, and you tell me about it, because I need to know. It's always being revealed. It's even into the 21st century, we're learning things. We're learning about people. We're learning how the pieces all fit together. And that's the amazing part of this. And the fact is, is that it's, imp it's important for all of us. If you like history, there's nothing stopping you going to the library and looking stuff up. No nothing stopping you grabbing your, your computer or your phone uh, and, and looking things up. And nowadays, everything's online. So it's amazing what you can see. It's amazing I can look, read texts of a town history from, you know, 1850 or 1880, and they're all in there. It's all there. And the other thing about it, which I'm going to draw back to my newspaper stuff, okay, is that the fact is, is that I'm a very staunch believer in telling history the way it should be. You don't, you don't rose tint it, you don't edit it, I don't care if it was awful, I don't hope, you have to understand that Anytime you are researching something, you have to leave your 21st century mentality at the door. It's like reading the Bible. We don't, we don't get all upset about, you know, how many wives or how many concubines people in the Bible had or the fact that they murdered each other or the fact that the things that happened or they had slaves in the Bible. The fact is, is that that happened then. And they did, the people did what they did because that was acceptable then. The same with slavery, the same with the treatment of people with disabilities, all the way up through, people just 
are not nice. <laughs> Human nature is that you're, you want to be better than someone else. You're always higher than someone else because it makes you feel better. And what happens is you, uh, so many times history's been rewritten by the people just like the ones who put up statues and they're honoring people. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that there's another history to be told because maybe that narrative is a little one-sided. And from my newspaper background, it's who, what, where, when, why, how. News basic for, you know, 411 of reporting. And you don't edit and you don't bias and you don't change. Even if you don't like it and even if you tick people off. Just did that with the fire department. I'm sorry, but you, you you tell things the way they are, and you don't editorialize because historians are really like reporters. And unfortunately, I'm a little disgusted at all the ones in the 1800s who rewrote history. But you have a great history here in Springfield, and dig into it because we need to. Our job is to correct the net, the narrative now. It's more important to focus on the good things. I'm not going to. You don't. You don't hold anybody um, responsible if they were a slave owner, because at that time that was acceptable. And the same thing as eugenics in the eight, in the 1920s. It was acceptable. The most intelligent people in in the country in the world thought eugenics was the, the way to go, and that's how they thought it was wrong. <laughs> until and they didn't get that until Hitler said. Hey, I like that theory. And then all of a sudden everybody went, oh boy, okay, that's a bad idea. <laughs> we can't breed Aryans. No. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? His, you know, it's important that we correct things because we know it's been, some things have been written incorrectly. And it's just fascinating to focus on people, focus on people who they just don't, you know, they, they weren't doing it for fame. All the letters, I'm almost done. All the letters, you can go online and view the whole collection for the whole nor all the northern states of Wilbur Siebert. It's with the Ohio Historical Society. Wilbur Siebert has all of the letters and all the data that he has. It's available online. And the one thing that is the, the thread through every single Underground Railroad agent in, who wrote him a letter, they all say the same thing. I didn't do much. I don't know much. I'll tell you what I know. Because they weren't doing it for fame and fortune. They were doing it because they wanted to help another human being and something in the country was wrong at that time. And we all know that slavery was wrong and that that's why we got rid of it. But all these agents were all so humble. And that's what's amazing is that I like to shed light on them and say, hey, you deserve a medal. You deserve somebody to know about you. So if you go away and you just know something more about Noah Safford or, you know, Titus Hutchinson or Ephraim Wright, someone else knows about it. I'm not just reading it and then putting the book, closing the book. So Sankofa, it is, uh, it is from, oh, sorry. Uh, Sankofa is from the Ivory Coast. Um, it's a symbol that's usually either uh, a heron turned back, head backwards, or the symbols that I had, the symbol right there. And what it means is you go back to the past to learn for the future. It's um, the Indinkra language, the Akan people on the Ivory Coast. This is the, the symbolism they use. So that's, I've picking that, picked up that, because we learn from the history how not to repeat it. So I thank you for your patience and for letting me go on and on. But I hope that you go and you start digging and you start learning all this great stuff. It's fun. Thank you.